A smile spread beneath the thick white beard that flowed from chin to waist. His Carhartt bibs were frayed and stained, the black and red plaid Pendleton shirt beneath it patched and faded, and the extra tufts on his feet looked like they'd been gnawed on by ferrets. But there was a spring in his step and a sparkle in the bright blue eyes beneath the brim of his hat. He wore the creased and grimy leather fedora at a sober angle, as befit a man of substance and property. He'd hitched a ride from the courthouse in Atna to Nanilpna with Martin Shugak, who had a crush on Abigail, the eldest of Father Smith's daughters. In a place where men outnumbered women seven to one, that crush was shared by every other male park rat between the ages of 16 and 40. Abigail, erstwhile fiancé of the late Louis Deem, and the seal on the land between the two men, remained uninterested. On the whole, Father Smith was pleased. He wanted a suitor for Abigail who would bring something more to the Smith table than raging testosterone. A strong back, a willingness to work, and his own caterpillar backhoe loader, say. By all accounts, Martin Shugak was not that man. But a ride from Atna to Nanilpna over 50 miles of lumpy, bumpy, unmaintained gravel road, offered for whatever reason, was not to be refused. Martin let him off at the edge of town after trying and failing to secure an invitation to dinner at some future date. Nanilpna was in the throes of its Memorial Day celebration, which featured a parade to be followed shortly thereafter by a potluck barbecue at the gym. The parade began with the white blazer with the gold shield of the Alaska State Troopers on the door, moving in slowly and stately fashion up Riverside Drive, followed by a dozen veterans in clean but tattered uniforms, marching proudly out of step. With Dmitri Totemov and George Perry carrying the flags, and Bobby Clark driving Jeff Talbot's camo jeep with Miss Nanilpna sitting in the back seat. Someone had coached her in the beauty queen wave, elbow, elbow, wrist, wrist. An anonymous flatbed had been commandeered by the Nanilpna Native Association and was manned by the four aunties, sitting in a half circle on upright wooden chairs, a quilt checkered with the colors of all 50 state flags spread over their laps. Spaces between the floats were filled with every kid in Nanilpna who had a trike, a bike, or a four-wheeler, dressed in their interpretation, or their parents, of wounded Revolutionary War militiamen bearing flag, fife, and drum. They clustered close behind the dump truck, and some of their imitation leather jerkins were so full they were leaking lines of candies, the instantly recognizable spore of the eight-year-old Nanilpnan during a parade. Because Global Harvest had rolled out a gigantic dump truck, with a dozen employees of the Su'ulatak mine in the back clinging to the sides so they wouldn't slide out, the bed was half-raised, inside which could be seen the employees standing calf-deep in candy. They were literally shoveling it over the side, a rain of, Father Smith stooped to scoop up a handful, Jolly Ranchers mixed with dove promises. Everyone who wasn't in the parade was watching it, and next to him, Iris Meganic unwrapped one of the chocolates and gasped. Look, she said, holding out the foil wrapper so people could see. On the inside of the bright gold wrapper was the Suulatak Mine logo, the golden sunburst with the line of mountains behind it. You had only to raise your eyes to the horizon to see that same line of mountains repeated against the eastern sky. That must have cost them a fortune, Harvey Meganic said, respect warring with envy in his voice. Not as much as it cost them to bring that dump truck in from the mine, someone else said. How the hell'd they do that anyway? Helicopter. Herc. Drove it in from Atna. Hasn't even been out to the mine yet. I wonder if they'd rent it out. I got a hundred yards of bloody creek gravel needs moving. That puppy'd get it done in a day. The kids swooping down on the thrown candies paid no heed. They were too busy stripping foil and stuffing chocolate into their mouths. Father Smith pocketed his handful and went for more, filling both pockets and the pouch on his bibs. He was only thinking of his kids back on the homestead. He cheered the parade and appreciated the barbecue to the tune of three heaping plates worth, indifferent to or outright ignoring the baleful glance of the four aunties who had descended from the flatbed to work the serving line. Afterward, he hitched a ride up the step road with Oscar Jimenez, partner with Keith Getty in a greenhouse that marketed fresh greens to gourmet restaurants and wholesale food stores as far away as New York City.
and cut peonies in bulk to florists worldwide. Rumor had it that they were partners in the carnal sense as well, which made them unnatural, godless freaks of nature and unclean to boot, not to mention no prospect as sons-in-law. However, he did notice that Oscar was driving a brand new Ford Super Duty Super Cab F-350 V8 Turbo Diesel Long Bed Pickup. Their business must be doing well. He wondered if perhaps it wasn't his duty to try to help Oscar and Keith through the difficult task of accepting their true identities, to lead them from the homosexual wilderness into the heterosexual promised land. God wanted to heal them. Marriage was a part of that healing process. He himself was God's humble servant. These musings were interrupted by the sudden realization that the leather seat felt very warm beneath his hindquarters. He grabbed the dash, half rising, panicking at the thought that he'd wet himself. Sorry, Jimenez said. Should have warned you. Heated seats. He flicked a switch and Father Smith subsided, trying to hide his embarrassment. He kept his hand on the door handle as a precaution against any assault on his virtue, as who knew what else could be expected from someone so self-indulgent as to own a vehicle with heated seats, and he debarked the truck with dispatch at the turnoff to his homestead. He raised his hat and gave polite thanks for the lift, because there was no excuse for bad manners, and lost no time in hoofing it down the trail before Jimenez could offer to take him to his very doorstep. The trail had been blazed out of the wilderness around bogs and rises with the D6 Caterpillar tractor. Today, around the second rise, Father Smith came upon a pickup truck parked in the middle of the trail. This was odd, as trail was something of a misnomer. The route into the Smith's homestead wasn't two years old. It had been maintained even less often than the main road, and the surface was not an invitation to regular traffic. Parts of it were constantly underwater. Other parts had been retaken by belligerent alders, determined not to be dispossessed. To find a strange vehicle on the trail argued one of two possibilities, that the driver was either very lost or poaching game on the parklands that abutted the Smith homestead. It was an elderly Ford Ranger three-quarter ton, the bed empty, dark blue paint rusting beneath a solid layer of grime that appeared to have been accumulated during the life of the vehicle. It had Washington State plates. Father Smith approached with caution, pushing himself between the encroaching thicket of diamond willow, just beginning to bud, and the driver's side of the truck. Hello, he said. The cab was empty. He looked around. Sparrows and chickadees were singing, crows and ravens were cawing, in the distance, he heard the incongruously cheery chirrup of an eagle. Not far enough away, brush crunched beneath the feet of some larger animal. He suppressed the unworthy desire for something heavier in the way of defense than the aged hunting knife in the worn leather sheath strapped to his belt. He reminded himself that God was on his side. Hello, he said, raising his voice. Anybody around who belongs to this truck? No answer. He put a tentative hand on the door handle. It wasn't locked. Hello? Still no answer. He opened the door and peered inside. There was a handwritten note taped to the steering wheel. He contemplated this in silence. The truck parked on the trail to his homestead was in itself an anomaly. A note taped to the steering wheel was bizarre. He would have been less than human had he not yielded to curiosity and read it. The note had been written in black ink with a broad nib, printed on a black eight and a half by 11 inch sheet of paper in large block letters, neat, upright, legible. The content was direct and to the point. I am returning my body to nature. I do this of my own free will. Please do not look for me. Oh my God, Father Smith said, with a dismaying lack of reverence. Hello! Hello! Hello out there! He cupped his hands and shouted, Come back! Come on! Nothing so bad that you have to do something like this. God loves you. You can come home with me, have a meal, be with my family. Hello! Hello! He called and shouted for a good quarter of an hour, but only the birds replied.